Hey guys, I'm going to now tell you the story about my tumor. I told you in my first video that I was going to make a separate video about my tumor, um, so that's what this is going to be. In February, I had my son and when I was in labor with him, my doctor asked me if I had ever broken my pelvic bone, which I haven't, and he said that there was a little lump. The lump ended up being kind of put on the back burner. We ended up having a C-section, and that became the forefront um, problem to deal with, and so we did the C-section, and the little lump just was kind of forgotten about and so at my six week postpartum checkup my doctor was doing an internal pelvic exam and she started pushing on something and she asked me if it hurt and I said no and she said that I had a, a, a large bony mass is how she put it she said that she had never felt anything like that before which isn't something you really want to hear from your doctor so we scheduled an x-ray and I was I was hopeful that it something would show up on the x-ray. I was kind of hoping that something happened during labor and that it was just a bone. So we did the x-ray and unfortunately the x-ray didn't show anything and so then we scheduled an MRI. I went in for the MRI. They told me that they should have the results within a couple of days. It was that very same night that my doctor called me and um, I missed the phone call at first. I think I was changing a diaper and so I missed the phone call and instead of leaving a message they called me right back again and at that point my my heart kind of dropped to my stomach and I kind of felt like it was bad news. I answered the phone and she said, we got the results of your MRI. You have a soft tissue tumor and a blood clot, and there's a bed waiting for you at the hospital, and you need to go right away. Um, that, it ruined my day, to say the least. Um, I, I went to the hospital they started asking me questions and asking me if I had a living will and asking me if something were to happen and I was unable to make decisions, who would be making decisions for me and these these were all really scary questions, questions that a few days before I hadn't really been thinking about at all and so I, I was in the hospital for a few days basically due to some misunderstandings. Before I left the hospital though, they did put me on blood thinners. So, and because I was nursing, I couldn't take um, blood thinning pills like Coumadin. So I had to do daily injections. I had to inject my stomach with a blood thinner twice a day. So I, I was on blood thinners and then I scheduled the appointment with my oncologist and um, went in for the appointment and it was basically a consultation just to kind of go over best and worst case scenarios and he told me best case scenario it was just a benign tumor and they would just be able to go in and remove it. The absolute worst case scenario would be that it was it was cancer and it was a lymphoma and that they would have to go in and basically remove everything it was touching um, and he said that I shouldn't worry too much about that because that was the absolute worst case scenario and I am absolutely healthy in every other aspect of my life. Um, so we scheduled a biopsy at that point. I had my biopsy and I waited what felt like forever to get the results. Um, you know, people say that no news is good news, but when you're waiting for biopsy results, I don't know, I guess it was just, it was it was really hard to wait for, for those results. And finally a nurse called me and she told me that it wasn't cancer and that it was something called a spindle cell fibromatosis. 
Um, and I was, I, I didn't get a chance to talk to the doctor yet. He was busy until he was going to call me the next day. And, you know, you would think that with the, with hearing that you don't have cancer, it would be a relief. But for some reason, I just, I felt uneasy. I felt really uneasy about it not being cancer. And, um... And so I, of course, went online and tried to look up spindle cells, and they didn't have a lot. And so I talked to my doctor the next day, and then he explained to me that it's it's called a desmoid tumor. It's also called a spindle cell fibromatosis, um, and that it's not cancer, but it's it's really dangerous, and that I would need to come in for another appointment to discuss it further and so we went in I went in to discuss it further and um, at that point he told me that uh, this is a really rare kind of tumor and um, that they would need to get a board together for my case to discuss what the best options were going to be so while I was waiting for them to get um, their board together and discuss my options, I decided to do research on the internet on my own. Um, desmoid tumors are very rare. Only about two to four people per million a year are affected by desmoid tumors. And there isn't a whole lot known about them. They they don't know what causes them. They're Apparently, they've been able to narrow down that they're more common in women, more common in women that have had children and are between the ages of 25 and 35. Um, so that's, that's basically the only narrowing down that they have for this kind of tumor. There aren't really any clear-cut treatment options. Um, like where, where cancer is concerned, you can do surgery and chemo or radiation and generally those will work. They don't really have a lot of proof or any, I don't know if they have any proof that chemo works on this kind of tumor. They have a, they're just, they're, the treatment options are difficult to come by. And um, the the nature of this tumor, it doesn't have any symptoms, it's very slow growing, and it can't um, metastasize, which means it can't um, infect the organs, the other organs it's touching. Instead, it invades the other organs. It's a very hard, it's like, it's very solid, it doesn't m like mold around, it just kind of grows through. So it will just invade your other organs until it is treated, um, which can cause severe damage. Um, the location of my tumor was in my lower pelvis, and the the area of your lower pelvis is so tight, all of the organs in there are touching each other. And so had it had, it had the chance to get bigger, it could have caused a lot of damage. Um, my tumor was seven, about seven centimeters in diameter, which is roughly the size of a baseball. Um, and so I, like I said, I did some research, and it, the, my research kind of left me wanting. I didn't, I wasn't able to find out a lot, and so I, I did, I waited some more, and then went back into the doctor and. He told me that the treatment they wanted to try was called embolism, which meant that they were going to go in and cut off the blood supply from the tumor in hopes that it would stop it from growing. I did research on that. There is only one case study that I could find where they did that, and it was unsuccessful. And even the doctor said that they don't, they don't think it's going to fix it. So... Um, they said that they, that's the option they wanted to go with, and they said they didn't think it was going to fix it, but it might give them more time. He said that they didn't want to do radiation because they didn't want to um, ruin the organs surrounding the tumor in case they decided they wanted to do surgery. They wanted the organs to be viable enough to do surgery, and radiation would kind of destroy the tissue. 
And so he said the other option would be to do a pelvic exoneration, which at my first appointment is what he told me would be the absolute worst case scenario. So now what the worst case scenario was, was my second option. And I was crushed. Um, I'm sorry. Um, uh, a pelvic exoneration would have meant that they were going to remove my uh, my bladder, my rectum, my ovaries, my uterus, and my vagina. Um, obviously, that would have been horrendously life-changing. Um, and for my husband and I, it would have meant no more kids. And that that was crushing for me to think that my only other option was going to be to have half of my internal organs removed. Um, this, I haven't talked about this in a long time, so it's, it's um, very emotional. Um, at that point, my husband and I went home and um, we just started talking about what we should do. Neither of us felt comfortable with the embolism that they wanted to do because the only other case study said it didn't work and we really did not want them to do the pelvic exoneration and so we just we started praying together and we eventually came to the decision that I needed to get a second opinion and so with the help of my my family we were able to find a doctor um, that is one of the world's best doctors for this kind of tumor. He has done extensive research and has done hands-on research for desmoid tumors and has patients all over the world that come to him for treatment of their desmoid tumor. And the only catch was that uh, it was in Ohio. I'm in Washington State and we had to go to Ohio to meet with this doctor. So that week, Saturday, was when we decided we needed a second opinion and by the next Friday I already had appointments in Ohio that we had to be at. So we had to fly out to Ohio and see this doctor and by that point I was having complications from my biopsy. A hematoma had formed and was pressing on my femoral nerve and so I was incapable of walking without excruciating pain and so at this point we just needed to see a doctor as soon as possible. So we went to Ohio and uh, I was in the hospital for three or four days while I was there just having them do tests and t going over the options that they had for me. And um, while I was there, I saw a gynecological oncologist. I saw a radiologist, urologist, and the surgical oncologist. So, and I had an MRI done. Unfortunately, the tumor had not gotten any bigger. They were just able to determine that I had the hematoma. When I met with the radiologist, um, he said, for that particular tumor, we would need to do five weeks of radiology. And he told me that ovaries can only handle, at most, two weeks. So if I were to do radiation, it would completely fry my ovaries, and once again, the option of having children would be completely gone. So I talked to the surgical oncologist, and he told me that he felt very confident that he could remove the tumor and that I could go on having kids and that we would just keep an eye on it. It's very common for this kind of tumor to recur. It doesn't spread, but it can come back in the same spot. Um, and that's because the it has these little tiny fibers that kind of spindle around into the surrounding tissue and the tumor can start regrowing from any one of those. And so they have to be able to take out enough around the tumor to ensure that that's not going to happen. And with 
where my tumor was located, that would have been really difficult to do. Um, but the, the doctor that I saw, his name is Dr. Raphael Pollock, and he's at the James Cancer Center in, at the Ohio State University. And I'll, I'll put his information in a link below. Um, and I'll also put information about desmoid tumors in a link below. But he felt, he felt confident that he could just remove the tumor for me. And so at that point, my husband and I talked about it. And, I mean, they, they gave us the three options. It was radiation to shrink the tumor for an eventual surgery or just radiation or just surgery. And my husband and I decided that in order for us to continue growing our family, we were going to just do the surgery. My surgery was scheduled for July 24th. This was at the, it was the beginning of June that we were in Ohio. At that point, we just prepared for my surgery and had a lot of prayers, had a lot of help from friends and family. And I, I felt really, really good about the decision to find the second opinion because at that point, I, I didn't feel like I mean, the internet didn't give me much information. The doctors where I am weren't able to give me as much information as I would have liked. Because of the rarity of this tumor, not a lot of doctors have worked with it before. And I wasn't willing to let a doctor experiment on me. And so I was really, really grateful that we felt impressed to find a second opinion and that we were able to find Dr. Pollock. Um, the surgery itself, it was scheduled to be an eight-hour surgery. It ended up only being four hours because fortunately um, the tumor was kind of self-encased. It wasn't attached to anything but my pelvic bone, which shocked all of the doctors. They were all super surprised that it wasn't attached to anything but my pelvic bone, which was really, really good news. Um, it meant that it hadn't really had a, had a chance to invade my other organs, and they didn't have to take any extra anything extra out. They just basically peeled the tumor away from my pelvic bone and were able to remove it. Um, and after that, I mean, I did have complications after surgery just due to my incision, but the surgery itself was an enormous success. And it, the outcome of all of this was so much better than I could have ever hoped for. And part of why I wanted to make this video separate from my original video was because I want to get more information on desmoid tumors out there. They are so rare and when I went to find information online I couldn't find anything that I found particularly helpful. Most of it were just medical reports and a lot of medical terms and I couldn't understand a lot of it and what I could understand was really scary. And, and I mean, and it is really scary. It's a very, very aggressive tumor, and if it's not dealt with, it can, it can potentially be, be life-threatening and definitely life-altering with the, the options that my doctors had given me here in Washington. Um, so now I, I have a 10-inch scar that's from above my belly button to right above my pubic bone, but I would rather have a 10-inch scar than have half of my organs removed. I think most people would. And I just, I want people to know that there are other options for you if you are dealing with a desmoid tumor. I would recommend Dr. Pollock to anyone that is dealing with this sort of tumor. Um, even if you have to travel, he is the best. When when I first met him, he came into the room and he was just like, before we say anything, I need you to know that I work for you. Anything you don't want removed, I won't remove. I will do or won't do whatever your will is. And so he just made me feel very comfortable and made me feel like I didn't have to worry because he was going to do whatever was in my best interest. As I was talking to his nurses, uh, one of them told me that 
told me about a client he has in Switzerland, and another one told me about a client he has in Beijing. He has clients all over the world that come to him because he is the best at desmoid tumors. He knows what he's doing, and he, he, he himself studies and researches desmoid tumors. He doesn't just go off of research that other people have done. He firsthand does it, and I just... I just want people to know that they have options, that if, if your doctor is trying to tell you that you just need to have your limb amputated or that you just need to have a half your organs removed, it might not be the case. Never be afraid to get a second opinion. I was afraid at first. I, in my head, I was like, well, these are specialists. They should know, and I should just trust them. But, you know, never be afraid. If you are uncomfortable with what your doctor is telling you, get a second opinion. It is so important that you get all of the information, whatever kind of sickness you're dealing with. That If you are uncomfortable, get a second opinion. I cannot stress it enough. I am so grateful that I got a second opinion, and I hope that this video has been helpful for you in getting more information on desmoid tumors and getting information on what your options can be. And if you know anybody that is dealing with a desmoid tumor, please share this video with them. Let them know that they have options. Please like and subscribe. Thank you for watching this video.